don't shut it off on you. Good morning. There we go. God is good. Let's try that again. God is good. And all the time. Wow. Um, I know this gets pitched to you probably every Sunday morning, but if you can come at nine o'clock for prayer, I, I highly encourage it. God shows up in mighty ways, and this morning uh, just felt a release of some things, I, I believe. Um, I want to read a scripture to you, what God has been speaking to me, and then it kind of was a, an overwhelming theme this morning. That evening, the disciples gathered together, and because they were afraid of reprisals from the Jewish leaders, they had locked the doors to the place where they had met. But suddenly Jesus appeared among them and said, Peace to you. Then he showed them the wounds of his hands and his side, and they were overjoyed to see that Jesus was there with the, see Jesus with their own eyes. Jesus repeated the greeting, peace to you. And he told them, just as the Father has sent me, I'm now sending you. And this is the verse. Then taking a deep breath, he blew on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. He's breathing on us today. He's walking in the room. He is looking for those that are hungry and thirsty and what God spoke to me this morning was this, I can breathe on you, but I can't fill that which is not empty. So at the same time he wants to breathe on you, he wants to empty you. He wants to empty you of the things that have happened this week that have brought you down, that made you not even probably want to be here, of the fears, the anxieties, of all those things. And he wants to fill you with his joy, with his peace, with his love, with his mercy, that every good thing there is to come from the hand of God. So this morning as we worship God, I pray that he will empty you. Lord, empty us of everything, Lord God, that is not of you, and fill us with everything that is of you. Fill us with your love, your joy, your peace. And Lord God, may you just overflow in us. Bless the socks off of us this morning. And may we bless you with our praise. May we sing at the top of our lungs. As Lord God, an old saying I heard, real men sing real loud. And so Lord God, may we sing real loud for you this morning. May our actions, our words, everything we say and do glorify your holy name this morning. We pray these things in the mighty and the powerful and the holy name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. let's worship. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Wait for Nathan to get tuned up. We thank you, Jesus, for this morning. We just rejoice in your goodness this morning, Father. We just receive everything you have for us, Father. We just lift our voices to you, Jesus. Joy, unspeakable joy, that rises in 
How about a testimony about how God's doing exactly what we're singing right here in our midst? Would you like to hear one of those? Yeah. All right. Hi. Um, <laughs> louder. Nobody ever told me to get louder. <laughs> <laughs> this one you want to be louder about. <laughs> anyway, this morning with pre-prayer, if you want to call it that, we were discussing God's faith or our faith in the Lord, and I stepped out in truth. I couldn't get any help from anywhere else. Uh, believe me, I've tried. Over the, uh, the last year, I have tried everywhere. Until I stepped into the truth with the Lord, like I, I did this morning, I came clean with all of my, all my problems, my worries, my past, and God has set me free. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So that is for you, if you've never experienced what we're singing about, His presence is here right now to do the exact same thing. If you knew this woman's story, you would be in awe of the God we serve. Amen? It's a new story, He has risen for It's 
the treasure he has here for, for me. It's a new dawn that is waiting for, for me. It's the treasure he has here.
this morning. Come wake me, Lord. Come wake my soul till you're mine. Oh, Lord. come and have your way, oh Lord. Come wake my soul till you're mine. Oh, yes, Jesus. Come. You are all things. You. Do. 
stagnant no more we say come and have your way oh lord come away come away lord come away lord come away lord yeah i want to encourage us with something concerning worship and concerning how we go about worship as a house 
There are um, awesome songs that God's given to certain people, and we, the words show up on the screen over there, and they're great. They're heaven birthed. Some of them are a few weeks old. Some of them are centuries old. All the songs that get sung up toward heaven are magnificent and glorious, and God loves every one of them. But I want to propose something to you. It's based on a full reading of the Bible. That God's favorite song is the one that comes from deep inside of us as individuals. It's like this picture. I know I've given it before, but you know when you get a card from somebody? Like this time of year, a lot of people give Christmas cards, mail them out to all their friends, and... And the words in the card, you know, some poet may have written something really nice in the card and it moves you and sounds really sweet. But what's the part of the card that you really look for? The handwritten part, right? The part that's personal. It's from their heart directly to you. It's not somebody else's words. It's right from inside of you. And I want to share, I want to propose to you that God's the same. That God's favorite song is the new song that comes from words that develop inside of us and then get expressed to Him. And all I want to say is you don't have to be a musician. You don't even have to be able to carry a tune. God created you tone deaf. It's all right. All 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 the notes somehow fit. If you like jazz, you know what I mean. Uh, they all fit somehow in the spectrum, just like all the colors match in the spectrum. It's, it, it doesn't matter whether you can sing or not. What matters is the purity of the expression. What God's after is those who will worship in spirit and in truth. So in spirit means a song that's birthed by the Spirit of God in you. In truth means it emanates because you understand. You know something about God. You've seen Him revealed as He is, and a song arises. Every single song that we sing with the words on the screen started out that way. There's no song. I don't care if you love hymns. I don't care if you love, you know, you're you're the type that wants to hear what was done last week. And that's what I like to sing. It doesn't matter. All of them began the same way. So here's a song they sang in heaven. In Revelation 5, John was taken up in the spirit and he saw this throng of people. And and he saw it and and all of these uh, saints sang a new song. It says in verse 9 of chapter 5, Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain. You purchased blood uh, with your blood men from every tribe, tongue, and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they'll reign upon the earth. But it says they sang a new song. So that song's now 2,000 years old, but it started out as a new song. When we have moments like that, the music's playing, we're in the middle of worship, you don't have to wait for the next set of words to show up on the screen. Let a song flow from your heart. And if you can't sing it, you know, if you're going to trip over that, like, I don't know how to make the notes to match, then just say it. Speak it. Tell God how much you love Him. How many husbands and wives, you look at each other's face, you want to have something to say that indicates, I love you. So let's say that to the Lord as we do that. And, And I just want to encourage you with that. When we have opportunity, let's sing that new song. It's a new story. He has read for oh, me. It's a new song he is singing for me. It's a new story he has read for. It's a new song he is singing over me. He is walking in this room. He is open light today. I'm in him. He is walking in this room. Let's hope my life today. I'm in here. He is walking in this room. He is hope my life today. I'm in here. He is walking in this room. He is hope my life today. I'm in here.
to new dawn Daddy's way Let's pray that over our own souls right now, if we would. There was a condition that all of us who knew what life was like outside of Christ were in, and it's that our spirit, our soul, everything about our inner man was completely dead toward God. There was a time in our lives that I try to get back in touch with from time to time to remember what it was like to have no God in my life. Maybe a concept of God in my mind, maybe some beliefs about a a mysterious God in my mind, but, but when I came to experience the reality of a living God who awakened things in me I didn't even know existed, there was a resurrection that happened on the inside of my spirit, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you're in Christ, something came alive again, but how many of you know that just like it requires us to keep breathing in the air around us for our bodies to stay alive, we've got to breathe in the atmosphere of the Spirit of God that God breathed into the first man and he became a living soul and we're in need of him breathing fresh life into us over and over again. So breathe in deep right now of the Spirit of God that's in this atmosphere. He's not a belief system. He is a real living God who's here with us right now to restore our soul, to revive our inner man, to revive us in our spirit. He wants to be more alive to us than we are experiencing life without him. So let's just receive it. Drink in deep right now. We speak to our soul. Wake up. Wake up. Stop sleeping through the presence of God walking on by. Stop missing out on the real living presence of God who's in our midst right now. Wake up. Experience the God who's there. 
You know, I think it's one of the most amazing tragedies in our individual lives, and it can be a corporate tragedy as well. Because Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you, right? Which means he's always with us. But he could be in the room, and we don't interact with him. Like imagine if you're in a gathering of people in an office or a room somewhere, and there's Jesus sitting right in that seat. Is he present? Yeah, he's present. Is anybody talking to him? Is anybody inviting him in on what's going on? That's the question of life. He's always with us, but do we say, okay, Jesus, you are with me right now. Be involved in everything that I'm about right now. Don't be just a belief in my mind. Be a living presence who is with me and in me and all around me. Jesus, we don't want any other just church gathering this morning. We don't want to be a people who just does business as usual church. We call on you to make your living presence alive on the inside of every one of us and speak through our mouths today, one to another, words of life. Minister through our hands today from the power of God to restore bodies and minds and souls, to work your healing through every part of our being. Work through us today, Jesus. Let, let us never become those who go about religious duties as usual. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we pray that you'll continue to move throughout our gathering now, even as the children prepare to do one thing and we move into another to hear an exhortation. We ask you, Father, to just come now and have your way in all things. Truly be our all in all. Amen. Amen. You can hug somebody, grab a seat. The uh, ushers are going to come around now and take up of our tithes and offerings. And while they're doing that, I'm going to share just a few things going on here. First of all, and it's great to have Caleb back in the house. The whole, it's like the Partridge family, the Bostorf clans all up here and all those who married in. It's good to have Nate back. Woo! <laughs> Tell you what, for more reasons than just that I love the sound of that instrument and all of what he does, it sounds like five people are playing up there, but um, after service today, even if you didn't sign up, I hope this is okay to say, Oh, there's a luncheon for Nate to hear about his trip, see some pictures, hear testimonies, all what God did in and through him, and there is lunch. So, free lunch, but better than that, some time with Nate to hear all about his trip to Israel and what God did there. So, stick around after service for that. There's another thing, this is, I'm calling an audible, this is a new thing. So, if um, we have actually a food ministry that we've done through the church it's mainly geared toward people connected with Hillside. It's a small, we're not trying to build another food bank. There's a bunch of those in the valley. But there are those in our midst who are sometimes having a hard time putting food on the table or paying other bills. So we have a really good food service. We get some good stuff, fresh produce, good uh, meat and stuff. I mean, they get Lebanon, bologna, some, it's good. It's just good stuff that comes in. And um, what we want to do now is begin to use that room in the back, which we renovated a few years back. It's now, as of Friday, reopened as a hillside food ministry. If you would like to be a part of that in any way, either driving to pick up the food, serving for an hour or so while the room is open so we don't just leave the back doors of the church open and unattended, or if you'd like to be part of like cleaning up afterward, taking the cardboard down to recycling, things like that. If you'd like to be a part of the administrative team, we're going to have a brief, I'm talking like five minute brief, and you know me, I can actually do five minutes. Five minute meeting after church to set up a meeting to start structuring it. So just meet me right over here by that little living room set up over there. Just don't knock over the door. We're going to meet right over there after church for five minutes and talk about what's next with that. Tuesday night. <laughs> right now, my baby girl is in Dallas waiting for her next plane to take her home. I'm going to see her at midnight tonight when she lands. I can't wait. So if I'm distracted today, I'm asking you forgiveness already. I'm out of my mind. She's on her way. My son is coming back from Hawaii Friday. You'll be seeing him around Hillside. He's he going to be back in the continental U.S. Well, until further notice. So that's awesome news. So you'll get to see Ben again soon. But forgive me for being so highly. I'm usually ADD struggled anyway, like focus player. But now I'm really, I'm sorry. I'm going to try my best today to stay focused. It'll take a miracle. Holy Spirit miracle. But Tuesday night, Michaela is going to be sharing about her trip here at 630. 
And she, um, now the sad news, says she's leaving. Oh, man. She's going back for a two-year commitment in January to serve as a leader with Mercy Ships. They asked her to come back and be on staff. So um, she'll require support for that, too. So if anybody was interested in partnering in prayer or finances, whether Tuesday night, you'll hear more about that. But Tuesday night, 630 here at the church. We, are, um, we support several missionaries, both at home and around the world. And one of the great things, one of the things that I've heard from all of them they appreciate about Hillside is that we send them cards for their birthdays, anniversaries, for their kids. If you've ever served overseas for any length of time, military missions, you know how much you, you get homesick, you miss the familiar faces and all that. And Barb LeBone, leading the missions committee, has done a spectacular job of keeping us in touch. I've heard from missionaries that are supported by churches far wealthier than us that what they appreciate most about Hillside, it's great that we send them money, but they said, we feel connected to you at the heart. We feel like somebody's actually praying for us and actually with us, even though we're thousands of miles away uh, serving the Lord. So what we're going to do now is put the birthday and anniversary cards out in the lobby. They'll be out in the corner to the right as you go into the cafe. That's going to be kind of like a mission central location. So I'd encourage you just to, you don't have to, you know how sometimes people don't sign cards because you feel like you got to say something deep or meaningful like you know of course now i just exhorted five minutes ago about how meaningful the words are at the bottom of the card but when it's a whole church full of people and they see 50 names on a card that man they really are thinking about us and sometimes all they need to know is yeah it was a passing thought i signed my name onto your card but i know it's your birthday and i prayed for you when i put my name on that card that's all they need so we're going to put those cards out we may need to get bigger cards now barb has actual detailed information For now, it's, yeah, so for now, they're on the desk out there until we get the missions display set up. Thank you for that. And just sign your name. Don't have to write anything deep. Yeah. I mean, if God gives you something, by all means, write it, but don't feel obligated to do that and not sign because you don't have something. Two of them right now. Okay, they're January, the two of them right now. So um, they will be there the rest of the month, but don't wait because I know all the, this church is... I won't say the worst. We are one of the worst procrastinating churches I've ever been a part of. Like, sign-ups always. 50% of the sign-ups will happen the day before the event. That's all right. Just don't miss out on signing those cards because it really means a lot to those missionaries. This week, if you took, hey, hey, great testimony, by the way. We had, how many cards were out there, Amber, for Adopt-A-Family? There were 35 cards to buy gifts for Adopt-A-Family. They were all taken. Some people came and they were gone already, actually. Um, this week, though, if you took one of those orange cards, bring the gift in this week. Don't wait till the last minute for the sake of those administrating it. The sooner they have it, the more you know, they're able to plan accordingly. So do that. Christmas Eve, we are having a service here. Todd G is going to be running it. Todd, I can't, man, I'm, we're going to video, right? Facebook Live it. Oh, you got to do Facebook Live. I'll be watching from Maine. All right, so we're going to have that Christmas Eve 6, 6 o'clock, right here Christmas Eve. It's going to be an awesome, sweet time together, and then you could go on out. All right, Megan is taking our children back to children's ministry, and she's going to tell us what they're up to today and pray over the kids as they go. <laughs> we are going to be continuing our lessons on Elijah and Elisha. Um, hopefully we don't get them mixed up, but we're going to be learning about a fiery chariot and a mantle. What do you guys think a mantle is? It's where you hang your stockings. Is it where we hang our stockings? <laughs> no, it's a different one. We're going to learn about a different one today in class, so we're going to just head on back in a minute. If we can just... Um, Extend your hands to our kids and we'll pray for them. 
Lord, thank you so much for this day, and thank you for these wonderful children that you've brought to us today. And we just thank you that they get to be a part of our lives and that we are blessed as they continue to grow and as we get to pour into them, Lord. We thank you as we go into the crazy Christmas season. We thank you so much that you are the reason that we are going crazy for you, Lord. So we thank you so much for this wonderful morning, and we just ask that you bless the rest of this day. In your name, amen. Awesome. How's everybody doing? Oh, me too. Praise God. I want to share some things with you today. And they, um, they, there's, uh, th there's a lot going on in our lives personally. There's a lot going on around in the world. And have you ever heard the expression, you know, that person's so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good? I hate that expression. I mean, I get it. I get it that there's some people that are just flighty. But that's not being heavenly minded. Heavenly minded, heaven's a very practical place. Heaven's already got all of history planned out and orchestrated. How many of you know that takes some kind of administration? The plan of God has already been mapped out. The end has been seen before the beginning. It's not the place where you go to lose your mind and escape. So there is a false form of what I'm going to share to you today that is rightly termed really more spiritual escapism. It's hiding from reality by using spiritual language. You all know what I'm talking about. Like you ask that guy who you know just lost his father and his son's off in some prodigal living and he just got diagnosed with cancer and he shows up to church and you go, hey, how you doing? He goes, oh, great, too blessed to be stressed. That's hyper-spirituality. That is not what we're talking about today. Let's be clear. Faith is not the avoidance of reality. Faith is seeing a deeper reality through what it is that we can see with our eyes and experience with our senses. That's what real faith is birthed in. Faith never ignores the reality of what's going on. That's, that's fake. Faith is not fake. That'll preach there, right there. Faith is not fake. Faith is more real than the reality that produces fear and anxiety and worry and anger and all of the other things that we experience in our emotional realm, that is only half of reality, maybe not even a full half. It's not worthy of being called half. What we perceive with our natural senses is only a sliver of the full reality. And so, like my daughter, in a few moments, will be boarding a plane, flying again out of Dallas, and whether it's cloudy in Dallas or not, She's going to see the sunshine because she's getting up to a higher perspective. So when we say set your minds on things above, which I'll read you the scripture that comes from in just a moment, we're not saying, come on, you got to escape out of reality. The fact is that people who don't, when we don't make an effort to be thinking from heaven's perspective, to have our minds wrapped around what heaven perceives, what the Father sees as he looks at our lives, when we don't live that way, that's when we're tempted to get into the cheap um, other kinds of escapes, the cheap substitutes for what the reality of his presence can uh, So we binge watch TV, like nine seasons of our favorite show, because I got to escape reality because it's so painful. For some, it's drugs, alcohol, some kind of substance that we use to escape reality. Anything that causes us not to look at a problem and say, that's nothing compared to my God, is a cheap substitute for the reality that heaven has. You guys getting this? You're really quiet for this. I thought, th this is the kind of thing that'll change our lives. This is the kind of thing that changes nations, changes the course of history, which we have opportunity to do, most especially with our own personal history, most especially with the lives that we've been given to steward and to live. So in Colossians chapter 3, therefore, if you have been raised up in Christ or with Christ, meaning you've died and I have been resurrected with Christ. Keep seeking the things above. It's like a picture of someone who, who, although, as I'll show you in a moment, we are in reality heavenly beings already. Our spirit has been revived. We have direct communion with God, direct access to the throne of grace. No hoops to jump through, no rigmarole. We have immediate access. We are in heavenly places. And yet at the same time, we live in these bodies in the earth in what we call reality. We live in this place where our bodies get sick. We live in this place where pain and suffering happens. We live in this place where injustices happen. All the things that make us look around and think, oh man, it's so horrible out there. 
And so it's like there's this churning of the mind. There's this exhortation that says, don't believe all of what you see is all of what there is. So we have this funny expression that people say, you're going to believe me or your lying eyes, which means I'm doing something that's wrong, but I'm a lie. I don't want you to believe that what I just stole from you, but I don't want you to know that I just stole from you. But the truth is that our eyes can lie to us. No, well, it's not our eyes. Our eyes can bring things in that our mind lies to us. So we see, for example, David going out on a battlefield could see a giant. And his eyes see, that man's nine feet tall and he eats soldiers for lunch. All the armies are afraid of him. I should be too. So he sees the reality of the circumstance, but he's aware of something higher. So he looks at a giant and he says, <laughs> you, I see you and I see God standing behind you. And I'm going to have you for lunch. Because I'm, I'm with him. God's with me. So you ain't nothing. I'm seeing with my eyes, but I'm seeking the things above. I'm seeking a higher perspective on reality that will bring me through. Um, what happened there? <laughs> you messing with me, Karen? So keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Seated means, uh, uh, seated is a posture when a king is about to legislate, when a king has already conquered all of the enemies, when a king has already uh, finished the battle. There's no threat to the king's rule. And once the threat's all been eliminated, the king then will sit down on his throne and begin to legislate, begin to govern from that place, a kingdom now in peace. That's the picture. So Jesus, having accomplished everything that needed to be done to reconnect us with heaven, to eliminate the threat of death and the fear of death, to conquer the grave once and for all, once all the battle was done, he sat at the right hand of God. Some, a king who is seated is an absolute authority over every situation. Seated is a comfortable position. When you come before the king, you stand or kneel. The king remains seated. The king stands for no one, but everyone stands or bows before the king. So that's the reality of where Christ is, and that's the reality we're seeking. So we set our mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. So the question really to ask ourselves when we're feeling anxiety, fear, worry, anger, all these other things and emotions is, what is my mindset on right now? What's my mindset? We all have a mindset. Our, our mindset determines the course of action that we're about to take. Once we're in a particular mindset, it means I am fixed on something. This is the direction I'm going to go. All behavior begins in the realm of the mind. Now, some of that behavior comes into the mind because of the desires of the heart. That's a whole other teaching for another time. But our mind, we always think and make decisions about what we're going to do next. So if our mind is just set on what we could see right here, how can we ever live heaven's way? How will we ever get to a place where we, we can become heavenly minded? Do you know what the reality is about that statement? The truth is that, yeah, there are some people who are so-called heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. But most of the body of Christ, most people, I'd, I'd suggest, are so earthly minded that we're no heavenly good. That we live in a realm where we think we got to get it all figured out. I got to conquer this on my own. I got to deal with that sin. I got to figure that problem out and I got to do it. I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. You know, you know, that term is an ironic term, right? You can't lift yourself up by pulling on your own bootstraps. Do you all ever think about metaphors like that? I do. I was a literature major. So I'm always thinking about it. I'm like, that's a really dumb picture. And oh, that's what they mean by that. It's impossible. So when Jesus said, well, apart from me, you can do nothing, the Greek word for nothing means like nothing. <laughs> really meaning nothing meaningful. You can eat, sleep, you can exist. As long as you have breath in your lungs, something's going to be going on. But you're not going to be doing any heavenly good. So let's not be so earthly minded that we're no heavenly good, both for ourselves and for the world around us. So whenever we weigh our thoughts without intentionally involving God in the midst of them, remember there he is sitting, imagine if Jesus is sitting in that chair, he is with me, and I can go about life, I can go about this meeting, I can go about all things without ever consulting him. It's a comfort to know he's there, and sometimes that's the limit of how we experience Christ with us. 
He's with me. I feel comfort right now. I feel an assurance like I have a safety net underneath me. So if I fail or I fall, there's somebody that will be there to catch me and lift me up. And there's a, that, that's one way, that's one level of living with Christ and experiencing the reality of what it means to have an ally like him by our side. But life starts getting worthwhile. We really start living when we say, hey, Jesus, what do you think about this? What do you see right now as we look at this? Jesus, can you walk not just by my side, but can you help my perception of this reality I'm seeing? Can you help me understand what's really going on? Because the things that are going on, a little scary, a little hurtful, a little like ang make me angry because of this injustice. So I want to see your perspective on it. So Jesus, I'm involving you on purpose with my thought life right now. You know how when somebody's crazy, we go, oh man, we do this. Do you know where this comes from? When we, when we turn over thoughts in our mind without involving the Holy Spirit, like that hurtful experience that somebody did to us or that injustice that we saw or experienced or whatever it is that made us feel whatever bad thing we feel, and we keep turning it over in our mind over and over again, you ever notice how the story gets worse every time you think of it, too? Like, we're, we're all fish storytellers. Whether you fish or not, we all do the same thing. The original thing that happened becomes a mountain because we keep turning it over and over and over and over. Before you know it, our mind's spinning out of control. So we got to get up in heavenly places and say, oh, stop that. I'll show you what, what that means when we take every thought captive. I, I, I did this, I got it from Karen Capuccio who used to do this and I started doing it myself. I used to be a lifeguard and at this one summer camp I worked at, we had a small pool whose capacity we never actually figured out. Probably 80. There were 150 kids at camp. So when there was like a 95 degree day, there were 100 kids in the pool, maybe 150 at a time. So it would get nuts. And we actually would clear the pool every 15 minutes to make sure nobody was getting stepped on on the bottom because you couldn't see the bottom. It was all shallow. So I'd blow the whistle and say, everybody out of the pool. How many of you know that sometimes when we forget to involve God in our thoughts and our mind starts doing this whole thing, that maybe you could do this too. Everybody out of the pool. Because I can't think right now with the mind of Christ that I've been given. So... What happens and what we're doing is we're going back to this mistake that our forefathers made, Adam and Eve. We're going back and doing the same thing that they did. Do you believe for a minute that God didn't want Adam and Eve to know everything there was to know? Would it even make sense that the God who created them for love would hold back on them, as the serpent suggested? But what they did was they said, we're going to eat from the tree of knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil. We're going to eat from that and have knowledge separate from our relationship with God. We will process life, we'll do things on our own. We'll know what's right and wrong, and we'll be just like God. How's that worked out for anybody ever since? We become our own God, and we wreck the place. And then we blame God for the fact that we wreck the place. It's like we, we got a new, brand new car that was given to us, and we, we drove it around for a while, and then we changed it, changed the oil, and we put vegetable oil in it, and, and the engine seized up. And we go, man, they didn't make this car right. You didn't do, you know, you messed up when you made it. Like, no, dude, it doesn't take vegetable oil. But that's what we do. When we separate our thought life, we separate the way we process life. Anything that we discern, decide, any opinion we create in our minds, anything we perceive that doesn't involve God in our thoughts, directly involve communicating with us in what we call prayer, then we've separated ourselves from his knowledge and we'll never walk in the ways of paradise like that. The reason why Adam and Eve had to leave paradise, Eden, which means paradise, the reason why they had to leave wasn't because God was mad at them and kicked them out of the house. It's what you've just introduced in here now. You are going to think that you can run this place without me. And you've introduced evil because you ate from the knowledge of good and evil, and you're going to get it wrong. You're going to think you know what's good and what's evil. You're going to think you know what's right and wrong, and you're going to get it wrong because what you're going to discover now is that you've got selfish desires that are going to rise up in you, and you're not going to seek love. You're going to seek what's good for you. And so you're going to wreck paradise, and in paradise is the tree of life. You're going to live forever like that. 
Oh, here's just think of how in a short 80-year-old life how we wreck the place without Christ. I mean, how quickly we can shipwreck our lives. Some of us, by the time we were teenagers, had already totally wrecked our lives. Imagine if you could live a thousand years <laughs> like that. I mean, the world got so bad in 10 generations, God said, i got to flood this place and clean it out. It's horrible down there because people are centuries-old experts at evil. And so when we separate knowledge, when we separate how we process life from God, we always create a world that's no, that we don't want to live in. So here's the beauty of the new covenant life we have. The reality of heaven now invading our lives and us then bringing it to the world as it is and recreating it as it ought to be. For you have died. Remember, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. You, you track you back to, to verse 2. Jesus sat down at the right hand of God. But you, that's us, that's you and me, have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. So if Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, where are we sitting? At the right hand of God. In him at the right hand of God. So when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, Jesus is real. He's as real as the air we breathe. But he's like almost like this invisible presence. That's what heaven is like. You know, and uh, we were just talking about this Wednesday night at our Wednesdays in the Word, how when we talk about going up into heaven, it's just a metaphor. There's no such thing as going up to heaven because what's up in the United States is down if you're in China. Right? So it's not like the pagans all believe just build a high tower, climb up the mountain, you'll be closer. You know, Mount Olympus, you'll be closer to where the gods live. That's ridiculous. Heaven is all around us. Heaven is like the air we breathe. It surrounds us and it's in us all at the same time. Heaven's not a place you ascend into. That's just a metaphor. Heaven is a place that surrounds us. So it's like heaven is right there on the other side of what we can perceive right now. So when Christ, who is a life, is revealed, a revelation, literally that word apocalypto, which we get our English word apocalypse, which we've totally destroyed the meaning of that word. We think, oh man, it's the apocalypse, which means everything's going to get destroyed, which is because of bad theology, but I'm staying off that soapbox for now. Because the return of the Lord is going to be an awesome day, not a horrible, dreadful day. Okay? <laughs> Stop! It's so hard not to go down that track. So listen to the teaching and I'll feel satisfied. It's revealed. I'm going to pull back the curtain and show you what's been there all along. I'm going to open your eyes to a reality. You, can, you want to get all sci-fi, another dimension that actually is surrounding you right now. And when it gets revealed, you're going to see all of what I've been trying to tell you all along. It's like God can see the reality of heaven all around us. Our eyes are blinded to it in our present condition, but it's just as real as the air we're breathing. Can you see the air you breathe? Nope. But you know it's there. You know why? Because every time you take a breath, your life is sustained. So it is in the spirit. So it is with heavenly reality. It's all around us all the time. So here's a beautiful thing. Carry, follow through with this. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, you also will be revealed with him in glory. There's something invisible to the eye, invisible to those who can't see spiritually, who only have this world's reality to look at. We're talking about the supernatural reality. When that gets unveiled, you're going to love how you look. We're going to love what we see on the inside. See, we, we've been trained by stinking thinking theology to think, oh, I'm dark on the inside. The heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? And we take all these old covenant words and we make them like their present reality. I don't know about you, but when I came to Christ, I got a promise that was given to me 2,000 years before it was even offered to man that I'm going to put a new heart in you. I'm going to remove your heart of stone and put in you a heart of flesh. I'm going to write my law upon your heart. I'm going to move you from the inside to follow my decrees. You ain't ugly on the inside anymore. We are gorgeous on the inside. We are so spectacular on the inside. When, when this flesh gets removed and when our eyes get to see spiritually who we are, man, we'd probably bow down and try to worship ourselves. You're all like, all right, now you're getting heretical there. 
I don't know about that. No, I'm telling you what the Bible says. We're going to be revealed with him how? In glory. Every time in the word of God, when the angels refer to glory, like Isaiah, I saw him high and lifted up and in his glory and his train filled the temple. It makes people sing. It makes people worship. When we get revealed for the reality of heaven's reality that's currently on the inside and all around us, we're going to be amazed at what we see. So life right now is really about tuning our present reality into what heaven's reality is because it's not for some future date. We're not one day going to be heavenly beings. We are right now heavenly beings. Trapped in earth bodies for a time, sojourning with this flesh, I can't wait to get rid of it myself. I don't know about you. I can't wait to see what the glorified body is like because it's so amazing. You can't even look at it. So right now, we inhabit two realms. We have a dual citizenship, but we exist really in two realms, the natural realm and the heavenly realm. We are seated in Christ. Our life is hid with God in Christ. It's not a metaphor. That's a description of our spiritual reality. Is this too deep? Are we all right with this today? I'm trying, okay, because you're all giving me that TV face sometimes. It scares me, and I feel like I have to over-explain, which makes the message longer, so you want to interact with me. <laughs> Just saying. So we're in two realms right now. We exist in heavenly places now in Christ Jesus, and we're equally present in both. So every thought process that we have here in the earth that doesn't result in the righteousness, the peace, and the joy that is the kingdom of God means that we are not even connected with our rightful selves. It's not just that we haven't connected with heaven. We're, we're like living disjointed from our own selves. We are heavenly beings. We're already sitting with them in that place. Our present reality is my mind, my heart, my soul is as connected with heaven as it is with the things my natural senses can perceive. That's my reality. So a lot of the angst, a lot of the disjointed confusion that we experience is because we have part of us in heaven and a part of us living in the earth and we're only living from the earth part. So even our inner man is crying out saying, what are you doing? Hello? I'm in here. I'm waiting. I want to communicate with you. I can see something if you'll slow down for a minute and ask. That'll remove immediately all those things that you're feeling that are weighing you down. That our inner man even is looking for that. So in Ephesians, God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions. I love that line. To all of those who believe, you got to jump through some spiritual hoops to access God's presence while we were still dead. How many of you know there is zero response that you're giving to somebody when you're dead? Unless you change the meaning of dead. Dead means not alive. You can't respond. So before we could even respond to the grace that was extended to us, before we could say, I love you too, when the Father says, I love you, he made us alive together with Christ. There's a heavenly reality that we haven't yet experienced in the earth. I know I'm going to get a little Calvinist for those of you who studied this stuff before. But the truth is that because heaven's already seen the end from the beginning, it really has always been just a matter of time before all of us who are in Christ came to our senses and came home to Father. It's just a matter of when. I'm going to leave that there and let you ponder that. He made us alive together with Christ because by grace we've been saved. Here it is. And he raised us up with him. And he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Did you guys catch the past tense of that? I'm sorry. I know I'm going too long, aren't I, sweetheart? <laughs> oh, that is too adorable for words. We are now seated. Not one day when we die and go to heaven, we'll sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Not one day when we die, then we get to experience all of this present reality. Actually, long since past tense reality that it's high time we caught up to. Seated with him. Seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's already a done deal. So that in the ages to come, he might, what, show the surpassing riches 
of his, graces in, of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So the day we tap into the reality of where we exist, that it's not just here in the realm that we can see with our natural senses and experience that way, but our present reality is that we're already in paradise. There's a portion of us that's tuned into the eternal. There's a portion of us, there's a reality awakened in us that's already experiencing eternity in Christ. The day that we begin to live out of that reality and stop living as if we could do it all on our own, stop living as if we can live this life without the power of God, without the presence of God, without the perception of heaven in our mind, the day that we do that is the day we start experiencing surpassing riches of his grace surpassing riches. This, that, that word surpassing is one of those words that has no good English word to it. It means like even if you had all eternity to count it, you still wouldn't be done, which is one of those blow your mind concepts because how do you keep counting for eternity and not, not get to the end of it because you're keeping counting for eternity. So how can you not get to the end of the eternal thing that you're counting? You know what I'm saying? It's like when you lay down and you look up at the night sky and you try to fathom, where does it end? You ever do that? I did, that was my first God encounter. I was like 12 years old. I went out to the country for the first time. It's where I saw that there were more than five stars in the sky like you could see in New York City. So I went out and I experienced it. And I was looking up. And you could see the galaxy, the Milky Way, band of stars out there. And I was just thinking, whoa, if I keep traveling through space and I get to the end, what's on the other side of the end? You know, and it just makes your mind go, because that's as far as this mind is capable. We can only grasp the things that we can experience with our natural senses. That's why we needed our spirit awakened. That's why God said, look, I gotta, I gotta pull you up here so you can sit down and look at things through a new set of eyes. Because if all you got to go on is what you can see down there, you're gonna be eternally depressed. <laughs> I shared earlier how every once in a while I try to tap into what it was like before I was born again when I had no God in my life. Just to scare the bejeebies out of me enough to remember, I don't ever wanna go back. Lived in that country, got the t-shirt, not going back. Those days are over. But it's the emptiness, the thought that this is all there is. That's actually how I came to God in the first place. I studied atheist writers. I was fascinated with them when I was a literature major. So I read like all these uh, postmodern drama writers and uh, all this stuff. And, and some of them were so good at describing truthfully reality of life without God. It's called existentialism. There's a 10 cent word of the day. It just means we just exist and that's all the meaning of life that there is. We exist, period. Don't try to attach anything else to it. They shared that philosophy so well. I came running screaming to God. I said, you gotta be out there somewhere, please show me, because this is hopeless. I, want, I feel suicidal and I never felt suicidal before. This is insane. It was a reality for us to experience now that it's all righteousness, it's all peace, and it's all joy in the Holy Ghost. That's when we know that we're sitting with him. So when we ponder circumstances sitting in heavenly places, our offense, the, the thing in us that, depending where we are in the spectrum, either we can't wait for the one that wronged us to get punished for what they did, or we do that whole, I forgive you because I know God's going to get you thing. You know what I'm talking about. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Yes. I'll let that go. And I'm going to be like Jonah and sit up on the hill and wait for the fireworks. Right? You might be there. might be to the place where I've forgiven, I've moved on, and I no longer want you to suffer for what you did to me. But the other end, when we sit in heavenly places, is we become like Jesus who from the cross said, Father, forgive them. Because I understand something. They don't even know what they're doing. I've got compassion on the ones who put me on this cross. How many of you know that takes a little bit of supernatural help? If you don't know what I mean, you've never been offended before. I mean, when you've been deeply wounded and you could sit in that place and say, I understand why you did what you did. And now my heart's been so turned around by sitting with Jesus in heavenly places. I actually can't wait to, uh, to be able to minister to you. I can't wait to, I hope I'm the one that gets to bless the one who cursed me. 
That's what happens in heavenly places. Our temptation, you know those things that we've been fighting against, trying to, in our own strength, and our own knowledge, without, I mean, Jesus is right there, but it's like we're saying to him, don't worry, I'll get it, I'll get it. I know I'm disappointing you. I know, I know, I know you don't like this, but I'm going to overcome this, I promise. This will be the last time I do it, I promise. And we go around that cycle. You guys are looking at me funny like you don't even know what I'm talking about. Don't give me that look. Amen. We start, thank you. We start fighting against it in our own strength. And, and instead of that, we come like David did to that place of absolute brokenness about the fact that that's still a desire that's still alive in us. And we get so broken over that condition that we finally fall on our face and cry out to God. And, and he's like, oh man, I couldn't wait for you to get here. Because you've been trying to, you, you know, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. How many of you know that there's no such thing as, as a yoke of oxen where there's only one oxen in the yoke? There's always two I was like, man, you've been trying to plow the field all by yourself. That must be hard. Wow, man, I'd be tired. Let me get in the next yoke right next to you, and we'll plow that field together and watch how my strength becomes your strength. And you start overcoming things. It's not even a temptation anymore. And the, the things that are causing anxiety, because you know what anxiety, fear, or, or you know, worry, all those kind of things. You know, in one of the most annoying scriptures to me at first was when Jesus would say, like, don't worry about tomorrow. I don't know why it bothered me. Maybe because hippies always irritated me. I don't know, my, even before I was saved, I was at that whole love, you know, and all this kind of thing. I'm like, man, you're just daffy. Put the, put the pipe down, you know, stop the bong and all that thing you're doing. Because you can't even think anymore. Oh, man, it's all right. And I thought it sounded like that to me until I got to know him a little bit and I realized, you didn't mean I don't want you to look at problems um, you know, as if they don't exist, like ignore them, pretend, you know, put them up in a puff of smoke like, like that. That's not what he meant. That it means I'm going to look head on at that problem, but I'm going to see what the solution is for that problem. I'm going to see how God is going to be able to come through and make even that work together for my good because I love him and I'm called according to his purpose. So our, my anxiety, our worry, because we think we know how this is going to turn out. Right? We've already played it around in our mind. Right, We've done this in our mind. I've played over all the possible scenarios. Every one of them ends in disaster. Some worse than others. And it starts going around. Whoa, 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 whoa. And before you know it, it's like we experienced it already. That's what anxiety is. Panic attacks and all that. They come because in our mind we've played it out. Rewind, replay. Rewind, replay. And we've played it over and over again. It's as if we've experienced it already. And the event hasn't even happened yet. So instead of that, I'm going to sit in heavenly places right now where it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. I'm going to sit right there. <sighs> Breathe in some heavenly air. Say, okay, Jesus, what do you think about this? How can you give me courage? How can you give me peace? How can you even give me a hopeful expectation where I think it's going to end in disaster? Turn that worry into a hopeful expectation. Like a Pollyanna approach to life. I, don't, I don't know a lot of people are annoyed at Pollyanna, and you call it, oh, yeah, you're such a Pollyanna. That girl won the day. She turned the town around. If you don't know what I'm talking about, watch the movie, and don't get irritated at Pollyanna. She's my hero. <laughs> but she was right. She's right. Ours is the God of all hope. <laughs> Guess what this He's the God of all hope. He's not the God of hopelessness. If we feel hopeless, God has not been involved in our thoughts. If we look at a situation and every way we think it turns out badly, God has not been invited into those thoughts yet. He just doesn't. Heaven is never upset about things. Heaven does not go, oh, whoa, see what they just did. Michael, did you see what they did again? It just doesn't happen up there. When we sit in heavenly places, Hopeful expectation. May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you could abound in hope. Super abundant hope. That's what, that's what is when we sit from that perspective. Our fear, fear is like faith. They're, they're uh, like twins. One's the evil twin, one's the good twin. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith means I can look at something and by faith I see it as if it's already accomplished. And my heart has experienced the outcome before it's actually turned out here in time and space. So faith, that's why faith is the substance. It's as if I'm already on the other side, I saw the end result, and I'm experiencing it in my heart on this side. Fear is the exact same thing. 
Fear is, I know, or I think I know, I know how this is going to turn out. I have faith that it's going to end in disaster, and now I'm all jacked up about it. And guess what fear produces? Self-fulfilling prophecies. Like Job, you know, the only thing that some theologians have found that might be wrong about Job says he was a righteous man, he was faultless, and so on. The only thing that some theologians have said, he said at one point, the thing which I feared has come upon me. Now, if you want to join with Eliab, Eliz, Elizab, and Zebub, and all the friends, so-called friends that tried to convince him this was all his fault, you could do that. But the reality was, what he feared became reality. Fear has just as much power to produce reality as faith does. We create self-fulfilling prophecies by what we fear, by rehearsing it in our minds and even speaking it with our mouths. So we've got to watch what the meditation of our heart is if there's something we're afraid of, a situation, a scenario, a person, whatever it is. We've got to be really careful about our meditation in our heart about that thing and get back sitting in heavenly places. I'm not afraid of the diagnosis the doctors just gave me. I'm not gonna in my mind, because he said I wanna take a biopsy, already be down there that I'm dying of cancer in six months, which is what fear produces. And faith in that, fear, can actually produce that. By faith, I'm gonna sit up in heavenly places and say whatever the outcome is right now, I'm gonna rejoice. I've got courage to face what lies ahead right now because I've been sitting in the Father's lap about this and I've got total comfort. I got back in touch with my eternal reality, which is that whether I live 50 years or 80 years or 12 years, I've got eternity. So I'm not afraid of what, what am I going to be afraid of? This is how all the martyrs did it through all the ages gone by. In Nero's persecution, there were Christians being rounded up, led to his palace where they were lit alive to be burned alive, to light up his garden parties. This is historical reality. And those Christians, when they were being tied on those poles, were singing praises. That was their testimony. The Romans testified. Pliny the historian testified. These Christians, when they go to, to die like this, they call it a martyr's death, and they seem to be eager to get up on their crosses, he said. How do you get that? How do you get in that reality? Man, you're about to be tortured to death. How do you do that with joy in your heart? You sit up in heavenly places and have a perspective. Remember when Stephen was about to be stoned to death? It says that the heavens were open for him and he saw the Son of God sitting at the right hand of the Father. That's how we do it. We tune into a higher reality. We tune into the full picture of what's going on, which is that what we see here is a small, tiny little bit of the full reality that heaven has to offer. So in 2 Corinthians 10, this is how it gets done in day-to-day -day life. This is 2 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 6. This is spiritual warfare defined. I'm just going to pull this one verse out because I've taught on this before. We are destroying speculation. So that's, I speculate this is, what's going to, this is how it's going to turn out. I think this is what's going to happen next. I, I speculate this is why you did what you did, whatever. Those are speculations. And every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, or another way of translating that phrase is against God's knowledge. In other words, every thought that tries to argue with what God knows about a situation. This is what strongholds are. When God communicates something to us, when he says, be not afraid, or when he says, I want you to go and do this thing, he communicates something to us. A stronghold is something on the inside of us that argues with the voice of God. That's what a stronghold is. So what we destroy with our spiritual weapons are all of those arguments when we argue against God's knowledge. It's almost as if we say, and none of us would put words to this, we probably wouldn't say it out loud, God, I think you're wrong about that. I think that what you're saying is true. I don't agree with that. So I'm going to go this way instead. That's what, we, that's what the knowledge of God. And how do we do that? We're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Every thought captive. Every thought captive. So if a thought invades our mind and it produces anxiety, anger, fear, worry, lust, you name it desire for power and control, if a thought enters our mind, we say, I'm not permitting you to wander around in here. You're in enemy territory right now. You know, the reality of 
life is that we are not in enemy territory. The enemy is in our territory. The earth is the Lord's and all the fullness thereof. I used to say that about spiritual warfare and it, I realized that's, that's just got it wrong. I'm giving the devil too much credit. We're experiencing spiritual warfare because we're on enemy territory now. We must be doing something right, right? We've said that. I've said that. I know. You know what the reality is? That this already belongs to the Lord. The enemy has tried to make some insurgent uh, attacks. He's trying to rise up in God's territory. So when we grab hold of a thought that's in our mind, you don't belong here. And in inner healing, I'll, I'll teach it like this. So you grab that thought and you shake it down. You waterboard it if you have to. You say, where did you come from and how did you get in here? How did you make it through my shield of faith? How is it that you still think you have a right to exist in my mind? You thought of fear, anxiety, worry, anger. Whoever you are, take me to your leader. Because I'm going to take that stronghold down before I lose my mind of Christ. You shake that thought down, take it captive, because the truth is, whatever thoughts we don't take captive that come from the realm of darkness, they're going to take us captive. And some of us live captive to those kind of thoughts because we haven't taken the upper ground. We haven't taken the high road, sitting in high places, every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, it says. So here's what, what some take this phrase to mean is that I'm taking that thought of temptation, I'm taking that thought of whatever, fear, anger, anxiety, worry, I'm taking that thought and I'm going to pull up my bootstraps and I'm going to obey Christ in this thing. That's not what it says. Taking those thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. I'm going to remember something, that greater is he who lives in me than lives in the world that I've not been called to live this life by my own strength. I'm called to live this life by the strength of the God who made me. I'm called to live this life from a new strength that God imparted to me by the Holy Spirit that enables me to live supernaturally. That means super, quite naturally. That to be supernatural is natural for a believer. We are supernatural beings. We don't have to stay stuck in this earthly reality. We have a supernatural component of us that enables us to do things, to obey Christ, to, to live the same way that Jesus lived. He fully obeyed the Father. Not once did Jesus ever say no to what the Father required of him. But out of love, he gave his heart and life and responded all the way to death on the cross. So capturing our thoughts doesn't mean we strive to live righteously. This is, that, that's not a scripture that says, discipline yourself and try harder next time. It's a scripture that says, hey, remember what's in you. Remember, you have the capacity of something that those lies are trying to move you away from. It means we live in a humble recognition that we need his power working in us if we want to live heaven's way. That's what, this that's what it means to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So if we fail to take every thought captive to Christ's obedience, we fail to say, uh-uh, that thought didn't originate in heaven. I'm not going to meditate on it. I'm not going to magnify it. I'm not going to give it more authority in my life than it has on its own, which is none, by the way. Did you know that anything from the realm of darkness has to ask permission before it can dwell in us? There is nothing from the realm of darkness that has a right to occupy the saints of God unless we give it permission, unless we open the door, unless we make a peace treaty with the enemy. As you read through the Old Testament, every time the Israelites tried to make a peace treaty with their neighbors that God said they don't belong in this land, it ended in disaster. That's what we do when we make a peace treaty with evil that, that finds its way into our minds, hearts, and lives. And so when we say no to that, uh, our, our thoughts rescue us, but our thoughts, if we stay there, keep us captive to the intentions of the kingdom of darkness. And that's not what they're for. So we have powerful weapons, and mainly we have a powerful weapon who is sitting right next to you. And so I'm going to place a demand on all of us as a body right now that we pray for one another. That right now, you don't have to confess what the thoughts are unless God is on you right now to do that. But I'd like you to pray for one another right now. Just turn to the person on your left, right, form groups of three. And I'd like you to go around and pray for each other. That whatever thoughts of anxiety, temptation, fear, 
uh, thoughts that would lead you to go a different direction than what God has for you, that right now, that God would help tune you into heavenly places. Pray for each other, that God would sit you together with Christ in heavenly places. And in about we're, we're going to end our meeting now in a few minutes. We'll, uh, we'll move on to what's next, but go ahead and take a few minutes to pray for each other now. Would you um, put some worship music on for us, and, and let's do that for each other. By all means, continue to pray and minister to each other. I don't want to interrupt any of that going on. But if you're remaining for the luncheon, you guys can go to the um, chapel. Where? Oh, it's staying in here. Stay in here. And if you would like to stay for the food bank meeting, um, also just come and meet me right up front after Craig finishes hijacking the service. <laughs> and don't anybody leave yet. <laughs> so is Pastor James here? Where is he at? Come on up. How about Abby and Audrey? Abby? <laughs> She's, I don't say Audrey. Anyway, so at the end of each year, you know, as a family, we like to help out 
our shepherds, our pastors. We know that sometimes it can be a struggle. There's things that go on throughout the year, you know, that uh, they deal with. But I was thinking about this the other night. I was out at Becca's, and we were in the living room. She deals with 12 kids. But when they were in the living room, they were doing somersaults and handstands. And just the joy that we see having that family together. And we like to appreciate the joy that these pastors and their families shed on us. So in appreciation for that, and I like Amber's encouraging words this morning. She said, Craig, we're not taking any more donations because the envelopes are full. So that's a good thing. So if you wanted to give, you haven't yet, you'll have to do it individually after this. But we like to present these two families with our token of appreciation for the Houtman yeah, and for so the players. Much. Thank you. So let's extend our hands and just pray for them. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for wonderful shepherds. We just thank you for their families and how they just interact with us. And we are just glad to be a family of God all together in one. So we ask your blessings upon them now. And thank you for this year and look forward to another glorious year. And we just praise you and thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And now James will express thanks on behalf of the pastoral staff. Is this part of the other duties as assigned? It's been a kick. I've seen it a little bit more recently. Um, this is so awkward holding this. Does the other mic work? We, we don't know. Okay, I'll, whatever. I'll just hold it. Um, man, I'm just I'm blown away. This is, Craig, you're right. This is full. And I don't know what to say except for thank you. We're, we're just very, very grateful. Very grateful to be a part of a church that really um, functions like family. Let's see. Ooh, that even sounds nice, too. Thank you, Todd. I don't know what else I was going to say besides that. But we're, we're really grateful because uh, this is uncommon, the way that church functions as family. And it's unusual. And we don't take it for granted. So we just, I don't know, I want to say thank you on behalf of... Uh, my wife and my family and Pastor Steve and Andre as well. So thank you. Looking forward to seeing you all over the next couple of weeks as, at Christmas as well. All right. And Nathan's going to do a presentation soon. So feel free to hang around for that. Hey, Amen. Back to you. I just, uh, I've said this before, but I always feel like, wow, they pay me to do this. Because um, you guys really do make pastoring a joy in so many different ways. We love you, and although my wife and I will be going with our family the next two Sundays, um, pray for us. Have a great time. We're getting all of our kids together and booking it out of town, so y'all can't have them. We get them to ourselves, but they'll be around for a little bit. But thank you so much, guys. It really means a lot to us. We, we would do it for, for nothing because of love, but when you express gratitude and love to us like that, it really does... Um, this is what I wanted you to do it. <laughs> it really ministers to our soul. So thank you, and uh, we love you. Merry Christmas. We love you. God bless you. And goodness, I'll see you in the new year. Merry yeah, Merry Christmas. <laughs> All right, so stay in the room. If uh, Nate, if you're staying for Nate, stay in the room. If you want to talk about food bank administration, come on and meet me up over here by the platform uh, right away. <laughs>